This video was made possible through the support of my patrons. It's kinda hard to know where to start when it comes to reviewing An Unearthly Child, the first Doctor Who serial, first broadcast in late November 1963. Honestly, forget all of the pomp and circumstance of this being the inciting incident of a TV series that would span almost 60 years and an entire universe of expanded material, when you look at the backstory of this serial, it's kind of amazing that Doctor Who got big in the first place. This was a production that went over budget, over time, there was a disastrous pilot episode that had to be restaged and reshot, and then the first episode was overshadowed by the assassination of John F. Kennedy, meaning it had to be retransmitted a week later. Surely, this story, this serial, had to have at least some merit to it, right? Especially since there was so much working against the brainchild of the BBC head of drama, Sidney Newman, and producer, Verity Lambert, in order to ensure this show's longevity. But what are the humble origins of this sci-fi show? Well, let's do the Cliff Notes version. For the first few decades of its existence, the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation, had a monopoly of the airwaves. But in the 1950s, channels like ITV started providing competition, which led to serial sci-fi shows such as The Quatermass Experiment and A for Andromeda. TV was also getting more ambitious, with larger studios and improved equipment, allowing dramas that were more than just screen adaptations of theatre productions. But with many of the higher-ups being with the BBC for a very long time, they found it difficult to adjust and move with the times, which led to the hiring of producer Sidney Newman from the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, where he served as head of drama. He'd recently spearheaded ABC's drama department, commissioning huge shows such as The Avengers and Pathfinders in Space. Kenneth Adam, the head of the BBC at the time, wanted Sydney to do for BBC drama what he'd done for ABC, which he did by first splitting the department into three, series, serials and plays, and disbanding the children's department. Around the time of Sydney's hiring, Donald Wilson, the head of the script department, had commissioned a report about the feasibility of a brand new sci-fi series on the BBC. This report found that there was a market for shows revolving around time travel and telepaths, but no bug-eyed monsters. Sydney became aware of this report when he was told of a gap in the Saturday night schedule between the sports showcase show Grandstand and the pop music show Jukebox Jury, with a perspective show in this time slot to have a 52-week run on the BBC. The first outline of the show was called The Troubleshooters, and this outline was penned by Donald Wilson, C.E. Weber, John Braben, and Alice Frick, about a trio of scientist time travellers, with a young male hero, a heroine, and an older man with some sort of character twist. However, Sidney Newman looked over the document and dismissed The Troubleshooters concept, with him wanting the show to be educational for kids, and, you know, scientists from the future would already know everything about the world around them. He also wanted to include a younger child to get into trouble and have more emphasis placed on the older man, now a 650-year-old alien who owned a time machine and had fled his home planet. The show, now dubbed The Saturday Serial, was allocated a £2,300 per episode budget and a £500 budget allocated to creating the set for the space time machine. The initial creative team was assembled, with TV directors Rex Tucker and Richard Martin on board, there was writer Anthony Coburn to put together the first serial, and by the time Sidney Newman brought over his ABC drama colleague, 26-year-old Verity Lambert, to serve as producer on the show, it had finally been called Doctor Who. Mervyn Pinfield came on board to assist with the creative details and assist the relatively inexperienced Verity. David Whittaker came on board as story editor, who would take charge of consistency and continuity between the different serials written by the different writers, and there was also director Waris Hussein, who replaced Rex Tucker, who had to drop out due to scheduling conflicts. However, Rex Tucker still helped to organise and oversee the initial casting sessions for the roles of companions Susan and Barbara 
Barbara. Verity and Warris took the ball that Rex Tucker threw and ran with it, casting William Russell as companion Ian and Verity deciding to approach actor William Hartnell to play the titular Doctor Who. The 55-year-old actor had a storied career on stage and screen, but had become typecast as stern authority figures and military leaders, and he was initially very hesitant to take on a role for children's television, but was convinced by the early scripts and the personality of Verity Lambert. Verity also cast Jacqueline Hill, an acquaintance of hers for the role of Barbara, and Warris Hussein discovered Caroline Ford while she was filming another TV series at BBC Television Centre. And with that, our main quartet was assembled. Now, the actual creation of the first few episodes almost doomed the future production of Doctor Who, but you know what? That's a story for another time. I think I've gone on too long already. We'll also talk about the other key players in the history of Doctor Who as we go. Let's actually start talking about our first story, An Unearthly Child, directed by Warris Hussein and written by Anthony Coburn, with Cecil Edwin Webber going uncredited for his work on part one. Now, a general discussion of this story is hard to do because part one, is so divorced from parts two to four, so let's just focus on part one for now. And where better to start with this story than its opening credits? This is BBC Television. <laughs> Even taking into account everything that's come after it, this 1960s mesmerizing black and white opening is a sight to behold. The first thing filmed for the series and designed by Bernard Lodge from the BBC's graphics unit and electronic effects specialist Norman Taylor with a visual camera feedback loop. And the kaleidoscopic effect was unlike anything seen before. And the basic typography of the logo complements the freeform visual so well, like time and space itself is breathing and pulsating, but the question Doctor Who has such clarity on the screen. And Ron Grainer's music? The melody itself is terrific and rhythmic, but it's the transformative mixing work from Delia Derbyshire and the folks at the BBC Radiophonic Workshop that elevates it, with the hissing interludes and how the notes almost seem to be vibrating out of the speakers. It's incredible. There's a reason that this template and these samples are still being used in the programme almost 60 years later. And going from the cloudy opening sequence to the misty Totters Lane junkyard is just an inspired transition, where we see a lone policeman inspecting the area and ignoring the police public call box that waits nearby. We're then at the Coal Hill School and meet teachers Ian and Barbara, who are intrigued about one of their teenage students, Susan Foreman, who has scientific knowledge beyond her years, but also lacks basic knowledge, like how the UK does not use the decimal system for currency yet. Her home address also leads to a junkyard, and her grandfather refuses to meet with the teachers. So Ian and Barbara follow Susan home in the dead of night in Ian's car, and oh my god, you'd never get away with that nowadays. Nothing to see here, folks, just two grown-ass teachers following a teenage girl home. Somebody call Ofsted. No, scratch that. Call the police. Use that telephone box in the junkyard. Except it doesn't open, and there's an old man pottering around the junkyard, with Ian and Barbara worried that he's kidnapped Susan and trapped her in the box. They eventually force their way inside, discovering it's a space-time machine that's bigger on the inside. The mysterious man, unnamed in the episode but credited as Doctor Who, refuses to let the teachers leave because they know too much, and in a fight for control of the vessel named the TARDIS, they're taken back a hundred thousand years into the past, where a mysterious shadow of a figure has seen their arrival. Terrific structure for a pilot episode, but that's not the only thing going for it, as the characterization is really strong here as well. Caroline Ford as Susan strikes the perfect balance here of just being odd enough to be out of place, but passing well enough as a human teenage girl. The first time we see her is when she's listening to rock music from a transistor radio, rocking an Audrey Hepburn modern style haircut, and doing a strange though understated dance to John Smith and the 
common men. And it's great how this innocent curiosity of who Susan is from the school teachers spirals out of control into thinking she might have been kidnapped before incredulously stepping inside a set that does not remotely fit in the box they were just standing by. And the contrast between these segments works so well, almost giving this episode a three-act structure before the plot when they go back in time, before it can even start. And we have Ian considering that there is an innocent explanation for Susan's behaviour before switching to the sceptic when confronting the Doctor. Conversely, Barbara on the other hand, near the end, seems a bit more open-minded, willing to go along with the impossible situation they found themselves in, but at the beginning she was a bit superstitious before heading into the junkyard for the first time. Silly, isn't it? I feel frightened. As if we were about to interfere in something that is best left alone. And inside that junkyard, there's no sign of Susan, but they do find a police box. Well, it's a police box. What on earth is he doing here? I mean, these things are usually on the street. I feel it. Feel it, you feel it? It's a faint vibration. It's alive. And also, the Doctor. And this introductory scene with William Hartnell is simply electric. He's approaching the scene with a smile almost the whole time, as he's toying with the teachers and trying to misdirect them, even giving some audible asides during the scene. One of our pupils, Susan Foreman, came into this yard. Really? In here? Are you sure? Yes. We saw her from across the street. One of their pupils, not the police, then. I, I beg your pardon? Why were you spying on her? Who are you? This here is my favourite shot though, with the Doctor pretending to look through pottery in the junkyard, but clearly eavesdropping on Ian and Barbara. It's almost impish, as this mysterious man who emerged from the dark is fooling around and trying to get these persistent people off his back. His presence is so idiosyncratic to everything that's come before, and I swear he even breaks the fourth wall during this scene and directs a question meant for the school teachers straight down the barrel of the camera lens. But why won't you help us? I'm not hindering you. If you both want to make fools of yourselves, I suggest you do what you said you'd do. Go and find a policeman. Or you nip off quietly in the other direction. It's selfie. But this playful nature is short-lived, as Susan opens the door and gives away her location, prompting Ian and Barbara to force their way inside the box, and I love the immediate contrast from the black and greys of the nighttime London setting to the whites and the slightly lesser greys of the massive TARDIS set, coming from the mind of production designer Peter Brachaki. Before, Ian was stumbling and falling around in the cluttered junkyard, but now he's swamped with this sterile space and no ceiling in sight, and there's even some light decor. It was a police telephone box. I walked all round it. Barbara, you saw me. You don't deserve any explanations. You pushed your way in here, uninvited and unwelcome. And the dimensions of the ship are just accepted. It's obviously impossible, but the Doctor just shrugs off their questions, possibly as another way to try and flaunt his supposed superiority. You don't understand, so you find excuses. Illusions indeed. You say you can't fit an enormous building into one of your smaller sitting rooms? No. But you've discovered television, haven't you? Yes. Then by showing an enormous building on your television screen, you can do what seemed impossible, couldn't you? Oh, yes, but I still don't... It's not quite clear, is it? Why won't they believe us? Well, how can we? Now, now, don't get exasperated, Susan. Remember the Red Indian. When he saw the first steam train, his savage mind thought it an illusion too. The Doctor's almost mean here, but it's grounded enough with a few subtle hints to their origins and how they came to be here that it's almost understandable. It's a terrific bit of writing to give the audience something to cling to as to who these mysterious people are, but in reality, they've barely been given anything at all. You're treating us like children. Am I? The children of my civilization would be insulted. Your civilization? Yes, my civilization. I tolerate this century, but I don't enjoy it. Have you ever thought what it's like to be wanderers in the fourth dimension? Have you? To be exiles? Susan and I are cut off from our own planet, without friends or protection. But one day, we shall get back. 
But the Doctor's attitude is made even more peculiar by the way Caroline Ford plays Susan in these scenes. She's not necessarily afraid of the Doctor, but she does plead with him to let her beloved teachers go, something he's not remotely interested in doing. He's found some playthings now, and he seems to enjoy the TARDIS console giving Ian a nasty shock when he tries to open the doors. The Doctor here almost looms over the other three characters, like a villain, at one point appearing to tell Susan to leave leave the TARDIS her home with Ian and Barbara so he can leave the 20th century on his own, such is his commitment to isolation and secrecy. However, that was a ruse, with the Doctor scrambling for the controls and the four hurtle throughout time and space, where we hear the wheezing and the groaning of the engines of this impossible ship. A sound achieved by sound specialist Brian Hodgson scraping his mum's front door key on piano wire and shifting the pitch. The group land, but Ian and Barbara are unconscious, and our protagonists and the 1963 audience have no idea where they've landed. The first Doctor Who cliffhanger. And you know what? It's one of the best. Amazing low lighting creating a looming, ambiguous shadow with the TARDIS in this desert-like landscape. Where are they? Another planet? Another universe? Come back next week to find out, I guess. This first part is pretty spectacular TV. The innocent curiosities, stalking teachers notwithstanding, lay the groundwork for a real sense of escalation and tension as the episode goes along. All of the performances are endearing with sparkling dialogue, the scenes in the junkyard are genuinely atmospheric, and the moment William Hartnell shambles onto the screen in full-on goblin mode and maybe even acting as the villain of the TV show, it becomes TV magic. Honestly, my only complaint here is that some of the camera work is a bit shaky, as some of the operators, quite understandably, struggle to navigate the dimly lit junkyard, but even the editing is really ambitious for the time. With the episode recorded mostly as live, with even the cutting back and forth between Ian and Barbara in the car and the flashbacks to Susan in the classroom being mixed live on the day, even before we've travelled across time and space, the production is going above and beyond. But... That's just part one, an unearthly child. There's three more parts with the main thrust of the serial to talk about, with each episode getting its own individual title. It's quickly revealed in part two, titled The Cave of Skulls, that the group have been taken back to the Stone Age, and the figure who has seen them is a caveman of the nearby Tribe of Gum, named Cal, played by Jeremy Young. The Tribe of Gum are, unsuccessfully, trying to harness the power of fire. The son of the tribe's previous now deceased leader is Zar, played by Derek Newark, and he's under pressure to follow in his father's footsteps, lest the tribe die in the upcoming winter. Obviously, our heroes don't know any of this yet, they've only just landed, and the Doctor doesn't even know where they are. Believe it or not, despite all of the eccentricities in future incarnations, and stories where the Doctor can just taste the soil or smell the air and know where they are, this Doctor has to go outside and take samples of the soil. And the sparkling dialogue from part one continues into part two, as Ian and Barbara, who for all intents and purposes have been kidnapped, try to wrap their heads around their new environment. Time doesn't go round and round in circles. You can't get on and off whenever you like in the past or the future. Really? Where does time go then? It doesn't go anywhere. It just happens and then it's finished. Oh. <laughs> You're not as doubtful as your friend, I hope. No. Barbara, you can't. I can't help it. I just believe them, that's If you all. could touch the alien sand and hear the cries of strange birds and watch them wheel in another sky, would that satisfy you? Yes. Ian even tries to reason with the Doctor by addressing him as Dr. Foreman. After all, he's supposedly Susan Foreman's grandfather, with Susan taking the name from the gates of the junkyard, but the Doctor does not acknowledge the name. What concrete evidence would satisfy you, hmm? I just open the doors, Dr. Foreman. Eh? Doctor Who? What are you talking about? Ah, 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 he said it! The Doctor opens the doors, and we can actually see the prehistoric Earth outside of the doors, an effect we wouldn't see repeated very often in the classic series, and our quartet step out into the unknown. However, the Doctor is disturbed due to his ship still being a police box. There's still a police box. 
Why hasn't it changed? Dear, dear. How very disturbing. But he doesn't dwell on this too much, however, as he collects samples alone nearby and lights up a pipe with a match. That's right, the doctor smokes. But the caveman, Cal, sees him light the small fire and kidnaps him, hoping to harness the flame for himself and become a leader, and shame Zar as a failure. And it's these scenes with the Doctor and the Tribe of Gum that serve as the most interesting characterization that this story has to offer. Let's go back to the first two parts where the Doctor is manipulating and toying with Ian and Barbara. There is a degree of civility to the conversations, where the worst thing the teachers can do is get the police. But even then, that's just another person for this Doctor from the future to trick and misdirect. There's a playfulness and an undeniable egotism to the Doctor as he flaunts his dominance, but all of that has to go out of the window when he's taken to the tribe of Gum. He really has no defence or way to fight against the cavemen, and they're so primitive and desperate and single-minded that his normal manipulation tactics won't work. In fact, in this case, they get him even deeper into trouble, and Hartnell's performance lays bare just how much trouble the Doctor knows that he's in. My matches, where are they? Let's go now. We have done. Let's go back to the ship. Cal's creature. He makes fire only for Cal. Take me back to my ship and I will make fire for you. All the fire you want. This is more of your lies. And you know what? I actually feel sorry for Cal here. An actual time traveller lands at his feet with the ability to make fire. Cal did see him light a match but no one from the tribe believes him. A lot of people write off the last three parts of this serial that are caveman-centric, and yeah, I get it. There's a lot of melodrama, a lot of gurning at the camera, not to mention the objectification of the female characters in the tribe. The woman is mine. My daughter is for the leader of the tribe. Yes, the woman is mine. But I actually find the survivalist arc of the tribe oddly compelling, and part of that is the dialogue, where there is a real grace to it, like how they call Ash Deadfire, or how they refer to the sun in the sky as the orb. We've got Carr's mate, Her, played by Alethea Charlton, realizing that our protagonists do not leave normal footprints because of their shoes. There's a branch broke. Uh, they have strange feet. They wear skins on their feet. Uh. That's great attention to detail in the script, but these moments of dialogue don't always work, like how they call the stone that they use at the door to the Cave of Skulls, the Great Stone. I don't know, maybe that one could have used another round in QA. But there is something baseline compelling about this tribe struggling to survive the impending winter. Zar isn't able to live up to his father's expectations. Cal is the outsider whose tribe died last winter, but he's stepping up to bring meat home every day. And we've also got the female elder, played by Eileen Way, afraid of what fire will do to the tribe after seeing how they killed Zar's father in order to harness the fire he could create for themselves. And I was about to say that it's not exactly Shakespeare, despite definite thought going into these characterizations, but there is some allusion to Shakespeare here, with her whispering in Zar's ear, trying to push him further, getting him to break the rules of the tribe, almost like a Macbeth and Lady Macbeth parallel. Or, you know what, you could even read this as Adam and Eve if you wanted to. The episode does give you enough material to work with, as her's pushing gets Zar injured, whilst pursuing the troubleshooters from the future, and he's a attacked by a beast in the forest. The Doctor is desperate for them to leave Zar to die and get back to the ship, but Ian and Barbara can't bear watching Zar bleed out on the ground. They go back and tend to his wounds, even instilling the word friend to her, and oh, uh, her means her. I, I just got that. Anyway, their unconditional kindness to Zar confuses her, but in return, she shows them out of the forest and back to their ship but the tribe have beaten them to it, and they find themselves captured again. Because the old woman helped the prisoners escape, Cal kills her with his knife, and the doctor tricks him into admitting it to the tribe, and leading a rebellion against them. And 
I know I get accused of forcing politics where it doesn't belong in Doctor Who, but I think fans falsely attribute the follow-up story, The Daleks, having the first openly political allegories in the series, but I think that this story's political moral is pretty explicit here. Remember, Cal is not stronger than the whole tribe. We are making fire for you. Hmm? I am watching. The whole tribe should be watching. Everyone should know how to make fire. Everyone cannot be leader. No, that's perfectly true. But in our tribe, the fire maker is the least important man. I do not believe this. He is the least important because we can all make fire. Now the character growth of this mismatched team trying to survive and win the day is interesting, but I think it's the main part of this serial that falls flat, but the setup is still really interesting to dissect. So the Doctor and Ian have been butting heads throughout the story as to who the de facto leader of the group will be. Ian tries to take point, but the Doctor objects every step of the way, including whether or not they should leave Zar to die of his injuries, with the Doctor refusing to help the injured caveman. So when Her has gone to get water, and when he thinks no one is looking, the Doctor does one of the darkest things in this character's history. Don't you want me? What are you doing? Well, uh, I, I was going to get him to draw our way back to the TARDIS. This just acts as a further extension of the Doctor almost being the villain stand-in of this series, as it's one thing to try and not help someone in need, and quite another to take their fate into your own hands because you think you're above them. The old woman won't give us away, she helped. You think so? These people have logic and reason, have they? Can't you see their minds change as rapidly as night and day? She's probably telling the whole tribe at this very moment. The Doctor may think himself as the better man, may prance around in an Edwardian outfit to communicate sophistication and class, but it's all for naught in 100,000 BC. Which brings us back to the Doctor and Ian driving Cal out of the tribe at the start of part 4, which the Doctor absolutely leads the way on, and Ian follows his instructions. And then, the next time the two have an interaction with each other, it's when Ian accepts the Doctor as leader of their tribe. Her said you were called friend. I am Zar. You are the leader of your tribe? No. He is our leader. It's a nice moment, it just doesn't really feel earned. While the Doctor getting Cal kicked out of the tribe wasn't nothing by any stretch, it does feel like Ian is taking a bit of a leap in character growth here. One big objection to this story from fans is how Barbara is depicted in the second half. She starts the serial level-headed, open-minded and rational, and then she starts losing her mind and acting hysterical. But honestly, I think that Jacqueline Hill sells the transition. It's one thing to see Susan screaming at everything, and I mean absolutely everything. You never leave his notebook. It's too important to him. It's got the key codes of all the machines and the ships, and it's got notes of everywhere we've been to. I don't think that ever happened to him. I know that we must find it. But it's quite another to see Barbara start to break down in part three, as the otherwise calm, collected and rational schoolteacher is whisked away with Ian to 100,000 years ago, lost in a forest pursued by beasts and tribespeople. Over there in the bushes. Oh, what nonsense. The bushes moved. I saw them. I saw them. Oh, we're never going to get out of this awful place. Never, never, never. Oh, I think it could have been run Oh, sheer nonsense, child. Imagination. Uh, uh, no, we won't. We're going to get back to the ship, and then we'll be safe. Oh, Ian, what's happening to us? I don't know. I might be in the minority here, but I, I think it works. I admit it is a bit dated, as the manly masculine men have to lead and stay strong as the women fall apart, but remove that context, and I, I did feel sorry for Barbara in this moment. Because, well, this is a story about desperation. Our leads are desperate to get home, whether it be the TARDIS or London 1963. The Tribe of Gum are desperate to survive, and the typical good-bad moralising of media goes out of the window when the cavemen are thrown into the mix. Cal is not a wholly bad person. Zar is not the unquestionable good guy, so there is something incredibly morbid about the scene where Cal and Zar start fighting in the Cave of Skull 
themselves to the death, and the Doctor, Ian, Barbara and Susan can do nothing except silently watch these two try to kill each other, with the Tsar eventually crushing Cow's head under a rock. And then, once Tsar has established himself as leader and has been shown how to make fire, he doesn't just let the group go, he keeps them prisoners because the basic cause and effect of storytelling doesn't really matter when you're dealing with irrational cavemen. This isn't a story where order is restored, the evil Cal is dead and our heroes get to leave on their merry way because they helped the good Tsar. No, they have to hatch an escape plan and then run away through the jungle, pursued by the tribe to their ship. <laughs> There's beasts in the forest that can kill them, the caveman can and will try to kill them, and by the time the group are running through the forest, directed really well as to give the audience no sense of direction or place, it almost feels like the show, Doctor Who, could have ended here and now, but the group do eventually escape back to the TARDIS, and Ian and Barbara discover that getting back to London won't be so simple, as the Doctor has no idea how to fly this thing. Have you taken us back to our own time? No, no, I can't do that. Please be reasonable. What? Please, sir. You must take us back. You must. You see, this isn't operating properly. Or rather, the code is still a secret. Feed it with the right data, precise information to a second at the beginning of a journey, and then we can fix a destination. But I had no data at my disposal. You're saying that you don't know how to work this thing? Well, of course I can't. I'm not a medical worker. The serial ends with the group landing somewhere with unique looking trees and the radiation counter going off the scale, unseen to our heroes. They've landed on the dead planet of the Daleks, and after the next seven weeks of TV, Doctor Who and British TV in general would never be the same. But before we can get there, let's start rounding up my thoughts on An Unearthly Child. Like I said, there's a lot of melodrama here, whether it be from Susan, who really quickly changes from strange student to helpless teenager over the story, or the cavemen characters, who are an acquired taste. Not to mention a couple of cheap moments, like in part 4, when Ian is trying to create fire but the sticks aren't even in contact with each other. I don't know, was there a genuine fire risk in the studio or something? Typical BBC and their red tape. But these do read like nitpicks when compared to the overall production of the story as a whole. The contrast between the outdoor sets and the TARDIS interior really cannot be understated. Almost everything in the junkyard is terrific, and I even love how abstract many of the cutaways feel. There's a surprising amount of fourth wall breaks, whether it be the Doctor in Part 1 or the Old Mother in Part 3. And the music from Norman Kay is pretty minimal once the group travel back in time, but I love the ominous music that kicks in whenever the focus is on Susan. Appropriately, the music fades away in the second half of the episode, with the ambiguous hum of the TARDIS taking over the soundscape. That's the best way to describe the music, more of a soundscape. When tensions start rising in the story, it's not a melody that kicks in, but a basic drum beat. Now part one is must watch TV, there's no escaping that, but you know what? I think the rest of the story holds up as well. It's tense as hell, the performances are strong, and there's a meticulous sense of pace and escalation with some basic but strong theming for what could have just been intensely primitive characters. And while the character dynamics of the main cast have a few teething issues, it's a compelling setup moving forward. But the show almost died right out of the gate, with the first episode broadcast on November 23rd, 1963, a day after US President John F. Kennedy was a Assassinated. This is the BBC Home Service. It is with deep regret that we announce that President Kennedy is dead. This is BBC Television. The episode did poorly in the ratings, being seen by only 4 million people, and those who did watch it were understandably still reeling, seeing the liberal hope of progress and positive change be struck down by a single gunman. 
It's interesting to see an unearthly child almost echo this public sentiment, with the story focusing on a progressive, civilized group trying to outmaneuver an aggressive and regressive force of violence, but I'm probably just reaching here. Part 1 was repeated a week later before the broadcast of Part 2, achieving a much more respectable audience size of 6 million. Not a bad audience, but still much lower than what the BBC wanted, with 5 to 6 million people still switching off their TVs or changing the channel between Grandstand and Jukebox Jury. Were it not for the immediate success of the Daleks in the coming weeks, Doctor Who might not have carried on past its initial 13 episode brief. But join us next time as we take a look at that original iconic Dalek story from writer Terry Nation. Or if you've already watched my Dalek Semba review of that story, then I'll see you at the BBC cost cutting measures taking full effect for a bottle serial set entirely within the TARDIS, the Edge of Destruction. I'll see you next time. Hey folks, I hope you enjoyed this review of Doctor Who and Unearthly Child. This is the first installment in my Hartnell Marathon. If you enjoyed this review and you want to be notified of when I do more, be sure to subscribe to the channel. It really, really helps me out and you can also hit that like button as well. Also, make sure you leave a comment below to appease the almighty YouTube algorithm. And if you want to support me in other ways, then you can do so by becoming a patron. If you become a patron, you can get your name at the end of the credits like these wonderful people here. You get access to a Mr. Titus Discord server. You get these reviews in some cases cases several months early, I'd like to give a shout out to these particular patrons. Adam Gratton, Angus Bajanison, Callum Baird, Chiba City Blues, Dan the Dreamer Shill, Daniel Davis, Darius, Darren Carver Balsiger, Dean Jones, Dragon Bugs, Dylan Whitaker, Finley Rude, Flipmeister MK, Ginger Animator, Hunter Graham, Jack D. Evans, James Ivory, Jared Saylor, John Campbell Reese, Joseph Adams, Leela, Zachary Taylor, aka Mario Fanboy 15, Matthew Perry, Michael Serrano, Miranda Logan, Nate Harris, Nathaniel Holden, Palex, Raven Woods, Reese Lloyd, Ross, Samuel Whitaker, Steve Fiore, Taylor Wooderson, The Brit Sniper, Timbo1834, Toby Loxton, Will, Zabi555, and strange folk. It's because of the generosity of my patrons that I'm able to keep doing what I'm doing and helping to keep the lights on here. Thank you so much to all of them. Thank you for sticking around this long. To watch the next installment of this marathon, click one of the links below. I'll see you folks next time.